The Lord be with you. We welcome you to worship today. I've gotten a lot of questions. You know, I always think you need to come to church and get some practical advice and wisdom about living. And my first tip of the day is remember to pick up your dry cleaning. So, um, uh, on that happy note, um, the prophet Isaiah says, just as the rain falls from the heavens and accomplishes God's good work, so too the word of God goes forth and will accomplish what it needs. So trusting that we will be sprinkled upon or maybe flooded out this morning, let's stand and let's greet one another in Christ's name. you to sign and to pass the friendship pads that are on the ends of your pews. Um, just a reminder that immediately following worship, we invite you to coffee and conversation in the gathering space or if the weather permits in the courtyard. Um, at 11.15, um, we are having a meeting for those of you who are going to Fowler in the Fireside Lounge. So just a reminder if that involves you, 11.15 in the Fireside Lounge. And um, just to remind you also that sign-ups for lunches are coming well. This week, I think we're, we're pretty well settled, but you might want to look at the other weeks in July and see if there's any time uh, for you to help us with this ministry. I do want to introduce to you uh, Pam Bush, who is the Associate Director for Student Care um, at Western Theological Seminary, and I think she's doing a little tour uh, checking up on all her students, and so she's here to see if we're mistreating Katie or not. Uh, but Pam uh, wants to just give you a few words of greeting, so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm actually here to say thank you to you. Uh, are, you are, we, are we on? Nope. Or, uh, <laughs> I'm actually here to say thank you to you for, uh, for having Katie uh, this summer. Um, I also bring you greetings from Western Theological Seminary. Um, our mission there is to prepare men and women to lead the church in mission. Uh, and a really important part of that is uh, students having an opportunity to experience ministry with real people. Uh, not just to hear about it in the classroom, but to actually uh, be with people. Uh, who can can mentor and guide that process. And you have agreed to do that this summer, and we are very grateful. Uh, we're grateful for the mentoring that you have given them and for the mentoring that your pastors are giving them. And I haven't been here very long today, but um, I've already heard about how hospitable you are and how appreciative Katie is of that, and especially how encouraging you are to her as someone who's quite young. Uh, because sometimes uh, it's easy to just write off somebody who uh, is pretty young, but you have uh, given her a real opportunity to learn and grow here with a lot of encouragement, and we are really appreciative of, of what you've done. So that's basically what I wanted to say, not to check up on you, but to say thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder, uh, first Sunday of the month, we are have the joy of celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper together, and as we always do, we just remind you that each one of you, all of you, are welcome to share, and you are all invited to Christ's table. There's a few instructions in this green box. If you wonder, mainly it is just a usual reminders. If gluten is an issue for you, the station on this far end will have gluten-free bread. That's where you should go if, if that's a concern. Of course, you may go there even if it isn't a concern. If you'd prefer not to commune, you may still feel free to come forward and cross your arms and come to Sophie or my station, and we'll be 
uh, glad to bless you instead. And always remember that staying in the pews is completely a good option as well. Just stay in the pews and an elder will uh, bring the elements to you if you just signal to them. But uh, mainly the message, as always, is you and everyone here is invited this morning. Just to let you know that Bernie Brom and Phyllis DeRouche are both at Jefferson Place recovering from major surgery, so we'll keep Bernie and Phyllis in our prayers. Yes? Bernie Brom is now back in the hospital. Oh, he is? Okay. Okay. Okay, so he's back at Pella Regional. All right. So we thank you for letting us know that. Um, anything else that we could include in our prayers? Let us worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who creates the heavens and the earth. Amen. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You. you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live.
bulletin. Loving God, we confess that we are not as compassionate as the Good Samaritan. We do not share as readily as the boy with the loaves and fish. We are not as humble as Zacchaeus or as grateful as the healed leper. We do not rejoice as boisterously as the man born blind, nor do we invest as wisely as the widow with the might. It is hard to practice your son's teachings in our lives. O oh God, help us to be more like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. For those who are in Christ Jesus. Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation, will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Believe this good news and live in peace. As people freed from the power of sin, let your love be genuine. Hate what is wrong but hold tightly to what is good. Love one another deeply and delight in opportunities to honor one another. Bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Beloved, live in harmony with one another. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Amen.
Now I'd like to invite the kids to come forward and Mr. Montgomery. <laughs> Good morning. The Lord be with you. Be also with you. Did you guys hear the rain last night? No. No? Me neither. I slept right through it. You too? That's awesome. Well, this morning, my friend Mr. Montgomery is here with us, and he's going to share um, a treasure. So would anybody like to open the treasure box this morning? Oh, my goodness. So many people. Okay, how about you have a turn this morning? See what's inside. Hmm. What is that? Do you know what that is? It's a a glass bowl, that's right. And it looks like a pretty plain glass bowl, but can you see who's on the side of that bowl? A bunch of people, actually it's a bunch of uh, children, and they're all holding hands, and they're in a line, and they're all holding hands, and I was given this actually kind of a plain glass bowl as a gift. Um, I just finished up my 37th year of working with students, and I've worked with students, small students and and big students. And I finished up my 37th year doing that, and uh, after 34 years, I was given this as a gift. So I could remember the time that I spent working as a teacher and working as a principal in a school. And I guess the reason I treasure this is every time I look at it, I'm just thankful that all those years that I got an opportunity to work with students and their parents, um, it was never a job. I always loved doing it. And I got up every morning and I was excited to go to work. Um, I had a good time. I liked to go out uh, to recess with students. I liked to have lunch with them. I liked to uh, you know, watch them work uh, and help them uh, get the things that they needed uh, to be successful in school. So I've just always been very thankful that um, I was given an opportunity to do something that I love to do. That's a really neat treasure. Thanks, Mr. Montgomery. Well, yeah, and you know, the other thing that I like about this is, do you ever, in your school, preschool or elementary school, do you ever take field trips? Do you? We used to take, uh, where our school was, we used to take walking field trips. And we'd walk around the neighborhood, and we'd meet the neighbors of our school. Uh, We'd look at signs of nature. We'd look at building that was going on in the neighborhood. And we, what we wanted to do was just make sure all our students knew that they were very important to our community. And they were a part of that community. And it was their job to make our community as good a place as it could be. And the reason I like that, uh, the picture of the students on that bowl is because when we would take walking field trips, we would, I would take a rope and I would be the first one to hold on to the rope. And then all my students would grab the rope behind me. And we'd just make one long line of people, kids and their teacher, going down the sidewalk. And that way I could keep track of where my kids were. And they weren't running around and whatever. But anyway, the point of that was, the message that we tried to send to our students was, we all need to take care of each other. And we all need to... Uh, grab onto each other uh, and keep track of each other. So, so that's my treasure. That's, that's really neat. The church is a lot like that too. Every person has a place. We all look out for one another. We hold on to one another so that we can all do the things that we were created to do and the things we love to do, just like Mr. Montgomery was created and loved to be a teacher. That's really neat. Let's uh, grab hands, and we will say a prayer together. 
loving God, thank you for all of these friends together this morning. Thank you for creating each one of us different and unique, with different skills and gifts. Help us as we all discover what it is you've created us to do. Help us do it cheerfully and joyfully, always looking out for one another. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's stand up. Congregation, would you bless your children this morning? Lord, Lord, bless you. from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21. Listen now for the word of God. Jesus looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all that she had to live on. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then continuing in our summer sermon series, on women in scripture, today we hear the story of the widow of Zarephath from 1 Kings chapter 17. So listen again for the word of God. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread. In your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we might eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, nor did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So I am going to guess that of all the stories that we've heard so far this summer in our summer sermon series on women in scripture, can any of you remember which they are? The daughters of Zelophehad, the Hebrew midwives in the book of Exodus who lived in Egypt, Tamar, the tragic princess, and the Shunammite woman. This story, the story of the widow of Zarephath, is the most familiar to us. Am I right? I see a few people nodding their heads. How many of you have heard this story before? Almost everyone. The story is about God's providence and even God's provision coming to us through the most unlikely people in the most unlikely of ways. Consider the widow of Zarephath. First of all, she was poor. She had nothing. And the story tells us that she was literally at the end of her rope getting ready to eat her last meal and then die of starvation. Secondly, she was a Gentile, a pagan from Zarephath, a town on the Mediterranean coast north of Judah in the region of Tyre and Sidon. Zarephath was at the heart of pagan Baal worship and the hometown of the despised queen, Jezebel. That alone, I think, would have made her repulsive to the prophet. And finally, she was a widow, which means that she was without recourse in the world. There was no one to look out for her and for her needs. A poor, Gentile widow. Three strikes, you're out. And yet, and yet it is precisely to this woman, the least of the least, that God sends Elijah the prophet. Go to Zarephath. God says to him, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Really? How absurd can God be? In a time of famine, you want to use the least able person to sustain the prophet's life? But if you read closer, or actually if you read the story just before this, you'll see that this is a pattern in the narrative. Just before this story, we hear that the whole country of Israel has been in a terrible drought for several years. And yet, God commands Elijah to go into a deep valley east of the Jordan River, and there to wait for ravens to feed him. Ravens, creatures that Israel considered unclean, unkosher, most likely because they were scavengers eaters of carrion. What is all this about? Elijah's life is to be sustained by ravens and poor Gentile widows. What's God really trying to say here? What is God's word to us and for us in this story? 
on first reading of this passage, you and I might take offense. What is God doing sending the prophet to a poor widow? She hardly has enough for herself. Why would she give what little she even has to sustain a man who could find food elsewhere after all? But both Elijah and the widow are obedient in this strange situation. Elijah doesn't say, come on, God. This is embarrassing. Can't you find a better candidate to feed me? Isn't this a bit unfair? This woman has nothing. No, instead, Elijah travels outside of his comfort zone and into foreign territory to ask a poor, helpless woman for help. And the widow herself doesn't protest too much. She does tell the prophet that she has no bread, only a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. After all, she is gathering sticks by the gate in order to make her last meal and then die. But when Elijah confidently insists that she give him the first bit of bread and promises that God will provide, she's obedient. She makes a bit of bread for him, and Elijah eats. And as we have come to see in many, many, many stories in the Bible, we discover that indeed, the flour and the oil does not get used up, but rather continues to feed the woman and her son for many days. Let me suggest a few things from this story. A few things about God's ways in the world and about our response to God's way. God sometimes provides for us in the least likely of ways. Let me tell you about a shelter dog who saved a man's life. Life as a 340-pound man had become unmanageable for Eric O'Grey. Other than for work, he rarely left his apartment in San Jose, California. He took insulin for type 2 diabetes and about 15 other medications, including antidepressants and weight loss drugs. Life became an exercise in doing as little as possible because he felt miserable all the time. Until one day, a doctor ordered him to adopt a shelter dog and walk the dog twice a day for a half an hour. His response, why a dog? Can't I just adopt a cat instead? And the doctor said, have you ever walked a cat? <laughs> so Eric went to the shelter with visions of the perfect dog dancing through his head, one that never barked, or shed or disobeyed commands, one that was cute and adorable. And then the adoption coordinator brought out an obese dog with skin problems. The dog was obviously depressed and seemed as excited to be adopted as Eric was of adopting him. But the adoption coordinator told Eric that he and the dog had a lot in common, and they both needed to work on the same things. They both needed to go outside and walk. At first, Eric O'Gray could only take his new sidekick about 100 yards before he'd turn back, huffing and puffing and embarrassed. 
but Petey, as he named the dog, seemed to like the walks very much. The dog would wag his tail and lick his hands and be so appreciative. So twice daily, they would explore the neighborhood that Eric had hardly ever seen. As the pair began slowly to become healthier and lose weight together, they developed a tight bond. I decided to become the person that my dog thought I was. And over time, every part of my life improved, Eric says. I was so reclusive and removed from society at the time that I needed a relationship in my life. It turned on emotions in me that I had never even felt before. In less than six months, Eric was off of all his medications. And in 10 months, he had dropped from 340 pounds to 185 pounds. He began having a social life and more energy. He started dating. He even joined a club for runners. He became a marathoner. I'm not a marathoner. And today he averages about five or six marathons a year. But he's quick to emphasize that his weight loss did not come from running or eating better. It was walking Petey twice a day and having a new relationship in his life. Petey saved my life, he says. Sometimes God chooses the least and the weakest to sustain us. In the epilogue to his book, In the Name of Jesus, Henry Nouwen tells the story of traveling to Washington, D.C. He traveled there with his friend Bill Van Buren, to give a lecture to ministers and chaplains and other leaders in the church. This was toward the end of Nouwen's life, after he had left academia. You see, Nouwen taught at Notre Dame and Yale Divinity School and Harvard Divinity School. He left those places, though, toward the end of his life and took up residence in a large community called Daybreak in Toronto, Canada. There, like all the other L'Arche communities, Henry lived and ministered among developmentally disabled adults while continuing his vocation of writing books and going on speaking tours. The Daybreak community had decided that whenever now one traveled, however, a member of the community would travel with him. And so it is that Bill, one of the developmentally disabled adults from the community, accompanied him on this particular speaking tour to Washington, D.C. And Bill was treated just like an owl, given a large hotel room, complete with a welcome fruit basket, and meals with the hosts, and a place of honor during the lectures. As Henry Nouwen tells the story, Bill had always understood that they were doing this, the lecture tour, together. And so at the beginning of the lecture, when Nouwen introduced Bill sitting in the front seat to the crowd, Bill stood up and walked up to the podium and sat right behind Henry Nouwen. At various times during the lecture, Bill would pipe up. Henry says this very often. I've heard that one before. At the end of the lecture, 
now an invited Bill to say a few words to the crowd. And in his disarming manner and slow, halting speech, Bill stood up and said, last time when Henry went to Boston, he took John Smeltzer with him. This time, he wanted me to come to Washington. And I am very glad to be here with you. The audience broke into applause. And as Bill left the podium, he said to Henry Nowen, how did you like my speech? I liked it very much, Nowen said. This is what he says now about the experience. In the past, I had always given lectures, sermons, addresses, and speeches by myself. Often, I had wondered how much of what I said would be remembered. Now, it dawned on me that most likely much of what I said would not long be remembered, but that Bill and I did it together would not easily be forgotten. For now, whose life had been filled with achievements and prestige and accolades and books published, this was a new thing to learn, but also a new message to share. Bill showed those who were gathered at the conference what true partnership and what true ministry looks like. Friends, such are God's ways in the world. God uses a poor Gentile widow to feed a prophet. God uses an obese dog to give new life to a depressed man. God uses a disabled man to teach Henry Nowen about partnership and ministry, something he had been talking about and writing about for decades. And God used a crucified man to inspire a worldwide movement and a church. Sometimes we are the weak and marginal and unlikely ones who bring good news. Sometimes we are the ones surprised by God's unusual ways. But such are God's ways in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> Beloved in the Lord, let us together then stand and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us lift up our hearts and our minds to God in prayer. Let us pray. Everlasting God, overflowing with love and patience and compassion, 
You are always listening, always eager, always seeking us, always waiting for us. So now, for these next few moments, we are going to try to give our attention and our hearts and our minds and our hurts and our joys to you. You know how we live lives that are busy and how so many things come at us and consume us and how easy it is to push you to the background. Help us, we pray, to live lives where you are the center. You are our joy. You are the one who directs us. You are the one who comforts us. So much of what you do in this world is unseen, mysterious, yet we trust that in your own ways and in your own times and in the most unlikely of people and places, you are putting your universe back together again. And it's our prayer that we might join in this work. So by your Holy Spirit in the days ahead, May we do simple things like offer encouraging words, smiling faces, warm embraces. May we also do things like acts of courage, deeds of incredible generosity, love that costs us, love that scares us, love that provides for others. Even as many things consume us and frighten us, confuse us, we pause now for a few moments simply to say thank you, to look at our lives and realize once again how blessed we are. We thank you for the joys of this season, for bright green grass and blooming flowers, for corn growing in the fields, for fawns and hawks and fruit and long walks with our dogs and good friends. We thank you too for those things that are invisible but have marked our lives and blessed us. For your relentless love, your mercy, the way you have guided us, the way you have opened and closed doors, for those who have nurtured faith in us, for lifelong friends, and most of all, for Jesus Christ and his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension. This morning we pray for those who were flooded overnight. In the days ahead, flood them with care and compassion. We pray for our summer sack lunch ministry, that every little child that receives a lunch might, as we will in a few moments, also receive the bread of life. In this week when we celebrate our country's independence, we give you thanks for this nation, for so much that is good and beautiful, the natural beauty, our food, our music, our freedoms, we give you thanks. At the same time, as followers of Jesus, help us to see where our loyalties lie. Help us to be people of compassion and welcome. We pray for the tailors today, and especially Jason, as he leads worship for the first time in Prairie City. And we pray for Andrea and Carson and Owen as they establish a new life there. We pray for health and wholeness today, for Kathy and Linda, Bernie, Phyllis, and for whom else shall we pray? You know, O oh Lord, that many of us suffer from chronic diseases and pain. Give us persistence, lighten our load. Others of us wonder about our symptoms and wait for results. We ask for good news. We think, too, of those that today are near to death. Hold them close as they come closer to you and leave this life.
Now, in a few moments of silence, we lift before you those things that we dare not speak aloud, but that trouble us, and we know that you want better for us. So hear these prayers of silence. By your Holy Spirit, set us free that we might find joy in sharing and that we might have love in abundance to bring to those around us. And at the same time, open our eyes and our hearts and humble us that we might receive gifts from the most unlikely of all sources. We pray our prayers in the strong name of Jesus Christ our Savior and our Lord, and the one who taught us together to pray by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now with joy and with gratitude, let us bring our gifts to the Lord.
generous God. Some of us give large gifts and others give two small copper coins. But all of us give our time and our talents. All of us give our thoughts and our words. All of us give our hearts and our minds to you. And through all of these things, may the love of Jesus be made known in your world. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, this holy feast we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, a feast of communion, and a feast of hope. We come to remember Jesus Christ his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, by which we are adopted as God's children now and always. We also come to have communion with this same Christ, who promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. In the bread, he comes to us as the heavenly bread that strengthens us to eternal life. And in the cup, he comes to us as the vine, in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. Finally, this is a feast of hope, a pledge, a foretaste of the great feast of love, which we shall all partake of when Christ's kingdom has fully come. And so each of you, all of you, are invited to come and feast at Christ's table today. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good to give God thanks and praise. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, eternal creator, holy trinity. Like a loving parent, you stay by us despite our disobedience. You correct us with gentleness and welcome us with a loving embrace. In Jesus Christ, you took our flesh and lived among us in humility, even giving yourself to suffering and death for our salvation. By your Holy Spirit, you call together your church, dwell among us, and fill each of us, one of us with gifts for ministry. For these and all your many blessings, we join our voices with the choirs of angels and faithful people from every time and tribe who continually praise you, singing. <laughs> upon the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. Your, Your death, death, Lord Jesus, we remember. Your resurrection, we celebrate. Your, Your coming, coming in glory, we await. With joy and gratitude, we offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices burning for your glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Come, Come Holy Spirit, make, make us, us one with Christ and, and unite Christ. us with all who share this feast. As this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks and blessed it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. 
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are ready.
Beloved, the Lord has fed us at his life-giving table, so let us offer heartfelt thanks and praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, never forgetting all God's goodness, who heals our diseases, who forgives our sin, who crowns us with love and mercy, who gave up even his own Son for us all. My mouth will praise, my heart will love, and my life will honor God, now and forever. Amen.